This audiobook is for educational purposes and is for personal use only. The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life, Volume 1 by Dronvelo Melchizedek. Chapter 1 Remembering Our Ancient Past How the Fall of Atlantis Changed Our Reality A little less than 13,000 years ago, something very dramatic happened in the history of our planet that we're going to explore in great detail, because what happened in the past is now affecting every aspect of our life today. Everything we experience in our daily living, including the particular technologies we use, the wars that erupt, the foods we eat and even the way we perceive our lives, is the direct result of a certain sequence of events that happened during the end of Atlantean times. The consequences of these ancient events have entirely changed the way we live and interpret reality. Everything is connected. There is only one reality and one God, but there are many, many ways that the one reality can be interpreted. In fact, the number of ways to interpret the reality are just about infinite. There are certain realities that many people have agreed on, and these realities are called levels of consciousness. For reasons we'll get into, there are specific realities that extremely large numbers of beings are focusing on which include the one you and I are experiencing right now. At one time we existed on earth in a very high level of awareness that was far beyond anything we can even imagine right now. We hardly have even the capability to imagine where we once were, because who we were then is so out of context with who we are now. Because of the particular events that happened between 16,000 and 13,000 years ago, humanity fell from that very high place through many dimensions and overtones, ever increasing in density, until we reached this particular place, which we call the third dimension on planet Earth, the modem world. When we fell and it was like a fall we were in an uncontrolled spiral of consciousness moving down through the dimensions of consciousness. We were out of control, and it was very much like falling through space. When we arrived here in the third dimension, certain specific changes took place, both physiologically and in the way we functioned in the reality. The most important change was in the way we breathed prana, a Hindu word for the life force energy of this universe. Prana is more critical to our survival than air, water, food or any other substance and the manner in which we take this energy into our bodies radically affects how we perceive the reality. In Atlantean times and earlier, the way we breathed prana was directly related to the electromagnetic energy fields that surround our bodies. All the energy forms in our fields are geometric, and the one we will be working with is a star tetrahedron, which consists of two interlocked tetrahedrons, figure one to one. Another way of thinking of it is as a three-dimensional star of David. The apex of the upward-pointing tetrahedron terminates one hand's length above the head, and the apex of the downward-pointing tetrahedron terminates one hand's length below the feet. A connecting tube runs from the upper apex to the lower point through the body's main energy centers, or chakras. This tube, for your body, as the diameter of the circle you make when you touch your longest finger to your thumb. It looks like a glass fluorescent tube, except it has a crystalline structure at the ends that fit into the two apexes of the star tetrahedron. Before the fall of Atlantis, we used to bring prana simultaneously up and down this tube, and the two prana flows would meet inside one of our chakras. Specifically how and where the prana meets has always been an important aspect of this ancient science, which today is still being studied throughout the universe. Another major point in the human body is the pineal gland, located almost in the center of the head, which is a huge factor in consciousness. This gland has degenerated from its original size, comparable to a ping pong ball, to its present size, that of a dried pea because we forgot how to use it a long time ago and if you don't use it, you lose it. Pranic energy used to flow through the center of the pineal gland. This gland, according to Jacob Liberman, author of Light, the Medicine of the Future, looks like an eye, and in some respects it is literally an eyeball. It's round and has an opening on one portion, in that opening is a lens for focusing light. 
it's hollow and has color receptors inside. Its primary field of view though this has not been determined scientifically is upward, toward the heavens. Just as our eyes can look up to 90 degrees to the side from the direction they face, the pineal gland can also look as much as 90 degrees away from its set direction. Just as we cannot look out the back of our heads, the pineal gland cannot look down toward the earth. Held inside the pineal gland even in its shrunken size are all the sacred geometries and understandings of exactly how the reality was created. It's all there, in every single person. But these understandings are not accessible to us now because we lost our memories during the fall, and without our memories we started to breathe differently. Instead of taking in prana through the pineal gland and circulating it up and down our central tube, we started breathing it in through the nose and mouth. This caused the prana to bypass the pineal gland, which resulted in our seeing things in a totally different way, through a different interpretation, called good and evil or polarity consciousness, of the one reality. The result of this polarity consciousness has us thinking that we're inside a body looking out, somehow separated from what's out there. This is pure illusion. It feels real but there is no truth at all to this perception. It's merely the view of reality we have from this fallen state. For example, there is nothing wrong with anything that happens, for God is in control of the creation. But from one point of view, a polarity view, looking at the planet and how it evolves, we should not have fallen down here. In a normal curve of evolution, we should not be here. Something happened to us that was not supposed to happen. We went through a mutation. We had a chromosome breakage, you might say. So the earth has been on red alert for almost 13,000 years, and many beings and levels of consciousness have been working together to figure out how to get us back onto the path, DNA, where we were before. The effect of this mistaken fall in consciousness and the ensuing efforts to get us back on track is that something really good something unexpected, something amazing has resulted. Beings from all over the universe who have been trying to help us with our problem have initiated various experiments on us in an effort to assist, some legally and some without license. One particular experiment is resulting in a scenario that no one anywhere had ever dreamed would become a reality, except one person in a single culture from a long distant past. The Merkaba. There's another major factor that we're going to focus on in this story. 13,000 years ago we were aware of something about ourselves that we've since completely forgotten, the geometric energy fields around our bodies can be turned on in a particular way, which is also connected to our breath. These fields used to spin at close to the speed of light around our bodies, but they slowed down and stopped spinning after the fall. When this field is turned back on and spins, it's called a Merkaba and its usefulness in this reality is unparalleled. It gives us an expanded awareness of who we are, connects us with higher levels of consciousness and restores the memory of the infinite possibilities of our being. A healthy spinning Merkaba is 50 to 60 feet in diameter, proportionate to one's height. The rotation of a spinning Merkaba can be displayed on a computer monitor using the appropriate instruments and its appearance is identical with the infrared heat envelope of the galaxy, figure 1 to 2 comma the same basic shape as the traditional flying saucer. The word Merkaba is made up of three smaller words, Mer, Ka and Ba, which, as we are using them, came from ancient Egyptian. It is seen in other cultures as Merkaba, Merkaba and Merkaba. There are several pronunciations, but generally you pronounce it as if the three syllables are separate, with equal accents on each. Mer refers to a specific kind of light that was understood in Egypt only during the 18th dynasty. It was seen as two counter-rotating fields of light spinning in the same space, which are generated by certain breathing patterns. Ka refers to the individual spirit and Ba refers to the spirit's interpretation of its particular reality. In our particular reality, Ba is usually defined as the body or physical reality. In other realities where spirits don't have bodies, 
it refers to their concepts or interpretation of the reality they bring with them. So the Merkaba is a counter-rotating field of light that affects spirit and body simultaneously. It is a vehicle that can take spirit and body, or one's interpretation of reality, from one world or dimension into another. In fact, the Merkaba is much more than this, because it can create reality as well as move through realities. For our purposes here, however, we will focus mainly on its aspect as an interdimensional vehicle, Merkava means chariot in Hebrew, that will help us return to our original higher state of consciousness. Returning to our original state. To be clear, returning to our original state is a natural process that can be easy or difficult according to our belief patterns. However, simply becoming involved with the technical relationships of the Merkaba, such as correcting our breathing patterns or mentally realizing the infinite connections to all patterns of life, for example, is not enough. At least one other factor is even more important than the Merkaba itself, and that is the understanding, realization and living of divine love. For it is divine love, sometimes referred to as unconditional love, that is the primary factor that allows the Merkaba to become a living field of light. Without divine love, the Merkaba is just a machine, and this machine will have limitations that will never allow the spirit that created it to return home and reach the highest levels of consciousness the place where there are no levels. We must be experiencing and expressing unconditional love in order to move beyond a certain dimension, and the world is fast heading toward that higher place. We are heading away from the place of separatism where we see ourselves inside the body looking out. That view will be gone soon, to be replaced with a different view of reality where we'll have the sense and knowledge of absolute unity with all life, and that sense will grow more and more as we continue to move upward through each level on our journey home. Later we will explore special ways of opening the heart to kindle compassionate, unconditional love so that you can have a direct experience. If you can just let this happen, you may discover things about yourself that you didn't know before. Dear reader, there are procedures in the workshops that cannot be reproduced on the tapes or in this book because they are totally experiential. They are just as important as the knowledge, for without them the knowledge is worthless. The only way we can give these experiences now is through oral tradition through a living workshop. But that may change in the future a higher, inclusive reality. Another component we're going to focus on has many names, but in present day terms it's usually referred to as the higher self. In the higher self reality, we literally exist in other worlds besides this one. There are so many dimensions and worlds that it almost surpasses human capability to conceive of it. These levels are very specific and mathematical and the spacing and the wavelengths in and between these levels are identical to the relationships within musical octaves and other aspects of life. But right now your third dimensional consciousness has probably been severed from your higher aspect, so you're aware only of what's going on here on earth. This is not the norm for beings existing in a natural unfallen state. The norm is that beings first become aware of several levels at once, like chords in music until finally, as they grow, they become aware of everything everywhere at once. The following example is unusual, but it demonstrates what is being talked about. I'm in communication with someone right now who is aware of many levels at once. The scientists who are studying her are speechless, they cannot understand how she does what she's doing. She might be sitting in a room, yet she claims to be watching from outer space. NASA checked her out by asking her to see a specific satellite and give specific information that could be known only if someone were actually there. She gave them readings off their instruments, which I'm sure seemed impossible to the scientists. She said she was flying alongside the satellite and simply read them. Her name is Mary Ansonfield. She is legally blind, yet she can walk around a room and no one would know that she cannot see. How does she do it? Recently she called me, and while we were talking she asked if I would like to see through her eyes. Of course I said yes. Within a few breaths, my field of vision opened up, 
and I was looking at or through what looked like a huge television screen that filled my field of vision. What I saw was astounding. It seemed that I was moving very fast through space without a body. I could see the stars, and at that moment Mary Ann and I, seeing through her eyes, were moving alongside a string of comets. She was very close to one of them. It was one of the most real out-of-body experiences I have ever had. Around the perimeter of this TV screen, there were about 12 or 14 smaller TV screens, each one giving extremely fast images. One of them up in the upper right-hand camera was flashing rapidly moving images such as triangles, light bulbs, circles, wavy lines, trees, squares etc. It was this screen that told her what was in the immediate space where her body was located. She could see through these seemingly unrelated images. There was another screen in the bottom left-hand corner where she communicated with other extraterrestrial life that was within this solar system. Here is a person who is in a three-dimensional body on Earth, but has full memory and experience of living in other dimensions. This manner of interrupting the reality is unusual. People do not normally see in the TV screens, but we do exist in many other worlds even though most of us are not aware of it. You presently exist on probably five or more levels. Though there is a break between this dimension and others, when you connect with your higher self you mend that break, after which you start becoming aware of the higher levels and the higher levels start paying more attention to you, communication begins. This connection to the higher self is probably the most important thing that could happen in your life more important than understanding any of the information I'll be giving. Connecting with the higher self is more important than learning to activate the Merkaba, because if you connect yourself to yourself, you will get absolutely clear information on how to proceed step by step through any reality and how to lead yourself back home into the full consciousness of God. When you connect with your higher self, the rest will happen automatically. You will still have to live your life, but everything you do will have great power and wisdom within your actions, thoughts and emotions. Exactly how to connect with one's higher self is what many people, including myself, have been trying to understand. Many people who have somehow made this connection often don't know how it happened. In this course I'll attempt to explain exactly how to connect with your higher self. I'll do my best. Left, and right at brain realities. There's one more component to this picture. I'll be spending perhaps half of our time on left brain information like geometries and facts and all kinds of information that to many spiritual people would seem totally unimportant. I'm doing this because when we fell, we divided ourselves into two really three, but primarily into two main components, which we call male and female. The right brain, which controls the left side of our body, is our feminine component, though it's truly neither male nor female. This is where our psychic and emotional aspect leaves. This component knows that there's only one God and that oneness is all there is. Though it can't really explain it, it just knows the truth. So there are not a lot of problems with the female component. The problem is on the left side of the brain the male component. Because of the nature of how the male brain is oriented a mirror image of the female it has its logical component forward, more dominant, while the female has its logical component toward the back, less dominant. The left brain does not experience oneness when it looks out into the reality, all it sees is division and separation. For that reason, the male aspect of us is having a difficult time down here on earth. Even our major sacred books such as the Quran, the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible have divided everything into opposites. The left brain experience is that there is God, but then there's also the devil perhaps not quite as strong as God, but a huge influence. So even God is seen in terms of duality, as one pole of the opposing forces of dark and light. This is not true in all sects of these religions. A few of them see that there is only God. Until the left brain is able to see the unity running through everything, to know that there is truly one spirit, 
one force, one consciousness moving through absolutely everything in existence until it knows that unity beyond any doubt then the mind is going to stay separated from itself, from its wholeness and from the fullness of its potential. Even if there's the slightest doubt at all about unity, the left brain aspect will hold us back, and we can no longer walk on water. Remember, even Thomas walked on water for a short moment when Jesus asked him to, but one little cell in his big toe said, wait a minute, I can't do this, and Thomas sank into the cold water of polarity reality. Where we're going with this information? I'm dedicating a lot of our rhyme to showing you beyond any shadow of a doubt that there is only one image in everything. There is one and only one image that created all that exists, and that image is the same image that has formed the electromagnetic field around your body. The same geometries that are in your field can be found around everything planets and galaxies and atoms and everything else. We will examine this image in great detail. We're also going to go into the history of the earth, because it is very important to our present situation. We cannot really understand how we got here if we don't know the process that led us to this point. So we'll spend a considerable length of time talking about what happened a long time ago, then slowly we'll come forward until we get to what's going on today. It's all tied together. The same old thing has been going on all along and it's still going on in fact, it has never stopped. Those of you who are predominantly right brain may feel inclined to skip this left brain material, yet it is most important for you to hang in there. It is through balance that spiritual health returns. When the left brain sees absolute unity, it begins to relax and the corpus callosum, the band of fibers joining the two hemispheres, opens in a new way, allowing an integration between the two sides. The link between the left and right brain widens, a flow starts, information is passed back and forth, and the opposing sides of the brain begin to integrate and synchronize with each other. If you're hooked up for biofeedback, you can actually see this happening. This action turns on the pineal gland in a different manner and makes it possible for your meditation to activate the light body of the Merkaba. Then the whole process of regeneration and recovery of our previous higher levels of consciousness can proceed. It is a growth process. If you are studying any other spiritual practice, you do not need to stop in order to begin the work with the Merkaba unless, of course, your teacher does not want to mix traditions. Other meditations that are based on truth can be extremely useful once the Merkaba is spinning because their noticeable results can evolve very, very quickly. I will repeat myself just so you know for sure, the light body of the Merkaba does not contradict or inhibit any other meditation or religion that upholds the belief that there is only one God. So far we've talked only about the ABCs of spirituality. These are just the beginning steps. But these first steps are the most important ones I know. Your left brain may love all this information and file it away in neatly labeled pigeonholes, this is fine. Or you can just relax and read this like an adventure story, a mind stretcher, a fantasy. However you read it, the fact that you are reading this book is what matters, and you will receive whatever you're meant to receive. In the spirit of oneness, then, let us embark upon this journey of exploration together. Challenging the belief patterns of our parents many ideas we believe today and facts we've been taught in school are just not true, and people are now beginning to realize this worldwide. Of course, usually these patterns were believed to be true at the time they were taught, but then concepts and ideas changed, and the next generation was taught different truths. For example. The concept of the atom has changed dramatically so many times over the last 90 years that at this point they don't really adhere to a concept. They use one, but with the understanding that it may be wrong. At one time the atom was thought to be like a watermelon and the electrons were like seeds inside the watermelon. We really know very little about the reality that exists around us. Quantum physics has now shown us that the person performing the experiment influences the outcome. In other words, consciousness can change the outcome of an experiment, 
depending on its belief patterns. There are other aspects of ourselves we hold true that may not be true at all. One idea that has been held for a long time is that we are the only planet in existence with life on it. In our heart of hearts we know this is not true, but this planet will not admit this truth in modern times even though there is powerful evidence of UFO sightings that have been coming from all over the world non-stop for over 50 years. Any subject other than UFOs would have been believed and accepted by the world had this subject not been so threatening. Therefore, we're going to look at evidence that suggests there is a higher consciousness in the universe, not only in the stars, but perhaps right here on the earth. As a side note, I suggest that you see two videos aired on NBC television as a special, hosted by Charlton Heston, The Mysterious Origins of Man and, The Mystery of the Sphinx. Both are distributed by BC Video at 1-800-508-0558. Gathering the Anomalies The Dugan Tribe, Sirius B and Dolphin Beings This drawing, figure 1 to 3, is truly remarkable. The information in it came from a book about Sirius, The Sirius Mystery by Robert Temple. He had, I was told, between 10 and 12 different subjects to choose from, each one of which would lead to the same conclusion but from a totally different point of view. I'm glad he chose the one he did, because it happens to relate to another aspect of what we will be talking about. Robert Temple was one of the first people to reveal certain facts, though scientists have known for a long time about an African tribe near Timbuktu called the Dogons. This tribe holds information that is simply impossible for them to have by any standards in our view of the world today. Their information destroys everything we think we know about ourselves in regard to being alone. You see, the Dogons have a cave on their land that stretches way back into a mountain, and in this cave are wall drawings over 700 years old. One particular man, the holy man of their tribe, sits at the front of this cave to protect it. This is his lifetime job. They feed him and take care of him, but no one can touch him or get close to him. When he dies, another holy man takes his place. In this cave are amazing drawings and bits of information. I'm going to tell you about two of these bits and these are only two of many. First of all, we're referring to the brightest star in the sky with an apparent magnitude of 1.4 Sirius, now called Sirius A. If you look at Orion's belt, those three stars in a row, and follow the line downward to your left, you see a very bright star, which is Sirius A. If you follow them upward about twice the distance, you see the Pleiades. The information in the Dogon cave specifically showed another star rotating around Sirius. The Dogons are very specific about this star. They say it's very, very old and very small and that it's made out of what they call the heaviest matter in the universe, which is close, but not actually correct. And they say that it takes, close to 50 years, for this small star to rotate around Sirius. This is detailed stuff. Astronomers were able to validate the existence of Sirius B, a white dwarf, in 1862, and only about 15 or 20 years ago could they validate the other information. Now, stars are very much like people, as you will begin to see. They're alive, and they have personalities and many qualities like we have. On a scientific level, they have growth stages. They start out as hydrogen suns, like ours, where two hydrogen atoms come together in a fusion reaction to form helium. This process creates all the life and light that's on this planet. As a star further matures, Another fusion process begins the helium process where three helium atoms come together to form carbon. This growth process continues through various stages until it gets all the way up through a particular level of the atomic table, at which point the star has reached the length of its lifespan. At the end of its life, as far as we know, there are two primary things a star can do. New data on pulsars and magnetars give other options. 1. It can explode and become a supernova, 
a huge hydrogen cloud that becomes the womb for hundreds of new baby stars. 2. It can rapidly expand into what's called a red giant, a huge explosion that engulfs all its planets burns them up and destroys the whole system, then stays expanded for a long time. Then slowly it will collapse into a tiny old star called a white dwarf. What the scientists found rotating around Sirius was a white dwarf, which corresponded exactly to what the Dogons say. Then science checked to see how much it weighed, to see if it really was the, heaviest matter in the universe. The original computations made about 20 years ago determined that it weighed about 2,000 pounds per cubic inch. That would certainly qualify for heavy matter but science now knows that this was an extremely conservative estimate. The newest estimate is approximately 1.5 million tons per cubic inch. Black holes aside, that would surely seem to be the heaviest matter in the universe. This means that if you had a cubic inch of this white dwarf, which is now called Sirius B, it would weigh about 1.5 million tons, which would go right through anything you set it on. It would head toward the center of the Earth and actually oscillate back and forth across the core for a long time until friction finally stopped it in the very center. In addition, when they checked the rotational pattern of Sirius B around the larger Sirius A, they found it to be 50.1 years. Now, that absolutely could not be a coincidence. It's just too close, too factual. Yet how did an ancient primitive tribe know such detailed information about a star that could be measured only in this century? But that is only part of their information. They also knew about all the other planets in our solar system, including Neptune, Pluto and Uranus, which we have discovered more recently. They knew exactly what these planets look like when you approach them from space, which we have also only recently learned. They also knew about red and white blood cells, and had all kinds of physiological information about the human body that we've recently learned. All this from a primitive tribe, naturally, a scientific team was sent over to ask the Dogons how they knew all this. Well, that was probably a big mistake for these researchers, because if they accepted that the Dogons really have this information, then by default they must accept how they got it. When they asked, how did you learn this? The Dogons replied that the drawings on the walls of their cave showed them. These drawings show a flying saucer it looks just like that very familiar shape coming out of the sky and landing on three legs, then it shows the beings in the ship making a big hole in the ground, filling it with water, jumping out of the ship into the water, and coming up to the edge of the water. These beings look very much like dolphins, in fact, Maybe they were dolphins, but we don't know for certain. Then they started communicating to the Dogons. They described where they came from and gave the Dogon tribe all this information. That's what the Dogons said. The scientists just sat there. Eventually they said, No, we didn't hear that. Because it didn't fit into anything they thought they knew, they just kind of hid the information somewhere under a carpet in their minds. Most people, scientists included, just do not know what to do with these kinds of facts. There has been a lot of information like this that we just don't know what to do with. Since we can't find a way to integrate this unusual information with what we already think we know, we just stick it away somewhere because the theories don't work, you know, if we keep it. Here's another thing the Dogons knew. This little drawing was on the walls, figure one. 4, but the scientists didn't know what the heck it was. Until computers calculated the orbits of Sirius A and Sirius B. As seen from Earth, this pattern shown in the Dogon cave is identical to the pattern made by Sirius B moving around Sirius A in a specific time frame, which happens to be from the year 1912 to the year 1990. The dolphins, or whoever those beings were, gave this present day diagram slash time pattern to the Dogons at least 700 years ago. Now, as this has unfolded in my life, I've discovered that both 1912 and 1990 were very important years. In fact, the period between these two years was probably one of the most important periods ever in the history of the Earth.
I'll explain more about this as we go on, but briefly, in 1912 time travel experiments began, as did experiments between the extraterrestrial greys and humans. We will explain later. And 1990 was the first year that the ascension grid for our planet was completed. And many other events happened during this period. The fact that the Dogen wall drawings pinpointed this period could be considered clearly prophetic. A trip to Peru and more Dogen evidence. I first came upon this Dogen information in 1982 or 83. I found myself around a group of people who were working with the Dogen tribe, who were actually going there and communicating with them. Then in 1985 I took a group of people to Peru, including one of these Dogen researchers. We checked into a plush hotel in Cusco called the Hotel San Agustin, intending to go walking the following day on the Inca Trail, about 40 miles over the mountain tops. You walk up to about 14,000 feet, then drop down to Makupiku about 5,000 feet below. It's beautiful. Our hotel was a Spanish adobe palace hidden behind high walls in the center of town. We were paired off so we could get cheaper rates. I was with the Dogen researcher, and he was constantly telling me about what they were learning, including a lot more than we're discussing here. We got a room, and the room number was 23. He got all excited and exclaimed, room 23. A very auspicious number, from Africa, where the Dogons live, the star Sirius disappears below the horizon and is out of sight for a couple of months. Then it appears again on the morning of July 23rd when it rises about one minute before the sun, it appears, bright ruby red, just above the horizon, almost exactly due east. Sixty seconds later the sun emerges. So you can see Sirius for just a moment, then it's gone. This is called the heliacal rising of Sirius, which was a very important moment for most of the ancient world, not just for the Dogons and Egypt. This is the moment when Sirius and the Sun and the Earth are in a straight line across space. In Egypt, almost all the temples were aligned with this line, including the gaze of the Sphinx. Many of the temples had a tiny hole in the wall somewhere, then there would be another tiny hole through another wall, then through another wall and another, going into some dim inner chamber. In that chamber there would be something like a cube or golden mean rectangle of granite sitting in the middle of the room with a little mark on it. At the moment of the heliacal rising of Sirius, a ruby red light would strike the altar for a few seconds, which would begin their new year and the first day of the ancient Sithic calendar of Egypt. Anyway, here we were in Peru, getting the room and remarking about the number 23. We walked into the room and set our things down. Then we both looked at the bed, and on the bedspread we saw this image, figure 1 to 5. We just stood there in amazement, looking at it for about 5 minutes before we could even speak, because the wheels in our heads were going around so fast, trying to figure out how this could be. If you look again at the image of the beings who got out of the flying saucer, they looked very similar. They were half in and half out of water air-breathing mammals and their tail fins were horizontal, not vertical like fish. The only sea creatures with such fins are cetaceans such as dolphins and whales. But the Dogen image is from Africa. And here we were in Peru, staring at a very similar looking mammal. This just didn't compute. So we asked the hotel personnel, what do you know about this emblem? They didn't know much. They were mostly of Spanish descent and weren't tied much into Indian legends. They didn't know the old stories of creation, so they had no idea what it meant. Here's a picture of the whole insignia, figure 1 to 6. In order to find out more, we rented a little car and drove around the area asking other people. We finally ended up at Lake Titicaca, talking to some Euros Indians. At one point I asked, what do you know about this? They said, oh, yeah, and proceeded to tell me a story that sounded very much like what the Dogons had told. This is their creation story, a flying saucer came out of the sky and landed in Lake Titicaca on the island of the sun, these dolphin-like creatures jumped into the water, came up to the people, told them where they came from, 
and in the beginning, began an intimate relationship with the pre-Inca peoples. It was this connection with the Sky people, according to the story, that launched the Incan Empire. I just sat there with my mouth open. Afterward, Simply Living magazine out of Australia published a whole series of articles on this subject. When people started investigating, they found that cultures all over the world have similar stories. There are 12 different cultures in the Mediterranean alone that tell a similar story. We'll come back to the dolphins a lot in this work because it seems they played a huge role in the unfoldment of consciousness on this planet. A Sanskrit Poem and Pi Let's look at something totally different now to suggest that the ancient beings of this world were perhaps more evolved than we give them credit for. Figure 1 to 7 is a phonetic translation of a Sanskrit poem. It was shown in an article published in Clarion Call magazine, in the early 80s, I believe. The English translation is shown below the Sanskrit. Over many years researchers have discovered that each one of these Sanskrit sounds corresponds to a numerical value. It took them a long time to figure this out. Figure 128 shows all the various sounds that are possible in Sanskrit. Each sound has a numerical value from 0 to 9, and some syllables have two number values. For instance, ka, a primary sound translates as spirit and corresponds to either 0 or 1, depending on its usage, I assume. When researchers took these different sound values and applied them to this particular poem, a mathematical figure came up that is extremely significant, 0.3141592653589. Continuing out to 32 digits. This is the exact number of pi divided by 10 carried to 32 digits. No one has ever figured out how to calculate for the decimal point, which is why this is pi over 10. If you move the decimal point one digit to the right, then it would be 3.1415 etc. the diameter of a circle divided into its circumference. Well, they might have known all about the diameter of a circle divided into its circumference, but in our culture's understanding of who these ancients were, there is no possibility that they could have calculated it with that kind of accuracy. Yet here is undeniable evidence. There are many, many of these poems and many, many other writings in Sanskrit. I don't know how far they've come in deciphering all of it, but I think that when all is said and done, it's going to be pretty remarkable. How did they do that? Who were these people, really? Is it possible that our understanding of them is not exactly correct? Were they maybe a little more advanced than we thought? This poem definitely suggests this. How old is the Sphinx? The following is also probably one of the most important discoveries on the planet ever. It's happening right now at this moment. However, it began about 40 years ago with R.A. Shwala de Lubitsch. He's a famous self-educated Egyptian archaeologist who has written many books. He and his stepdaughter, Lucy Lamy, have demonstrated a profound understanding of sacred geometry and the Egyptian culture. While observing the Sphinx, Shwala de Lubitsch became especially interested in the tremendous wear on its surface. Toward the back of the Sphinx there are wear patterns that cut 12 feet deep into its surface, and this type of wear pattern is totally different from the patterns on other buildings in Egypt, figure 1 to 9. The wear patterns on other buildings, supposedly built at the same time, are textured by sand and wind, which is consistent if the buildings are, as believed, around 4000 years old. But the wear patterns on the Sphinx look like they've been smoothed with water. According to mainstream thought, the Sphinx, the Great Pyramid and other associated buildings were built about 4500 years ago in the 4th dynasty under Copts. When this discrepancy was brought up to Egyptian archaeologists, they refused to listen. This went on for about 40 years. Other people noticed it, but the Egyptians simply would not admit the obvious. Then a man named John Anthony West became interested. He has written many books on Egypt, including Serpent in the Sky and a fine Egyptian guidebook. When he heard about the Sphinx dispute, he went to look for himself. 
he could see that the wear was incredibly excessive and that it did look like water had caused the wear. He also found, like Schwaler de Lubitsch, that he could not get the accredited archaeologists to listen to his beliefs about the Sphinx. There's a reason for this denial, I believe. Please understand, I am not trying to discredit a major religion. I am merely reporting. You see, there are around 5,000 Egyptian archaeologists in the world, and they all pretty much agree with each other in most ways. This agreement has become a tradition. They make little changes, but not too many, and not too fast, either, and most agree on the age of the pyramids. All of these archaeologists are Muslim, with a few exceptions, and their holy book is the Quran. The Quran, in its traditional interpretation, says that creation began about 6,000 years ago. So if a Muslim were to say that a building is 8,000 years old, he would be disputing their Bible. They cannot do that. They simply cannot, so they won't even talk about it, won't even discuss it. If you say that anything is more than 6,000 years old, they will not agree. They will do anything to protect their belief, making sure that no one knows about any man-made objects that might be more than 6,000 years old. For instance, they've enclosed the pyramids of the first dynasty, which are older than Saqqara, and built military fortifications around and within the walls so nobody can get to them. Why? Because they are older than or close to 6,000 years. So John Anthony West stepped outside the Egyptian archaeology world and brought in an American geologist named Robert Sock, who did a computer analysis that gave a totally different, scientific point of view. Lo and behold, beyond any doubt at all, the Sphinx does have water wear patterns and in a desert that's at least 7,000 years old, it puts it well over the age of 6,000 years. On top of that, computers have calculated that it would take a minimum of 1,000 years of continuous, torrential rains dumped on the Sphinx, non-stop for 24 hours a day to cause that kind wear. This means the Sphinx has to be at least 8,000 years old minimum because it's not likely that it bucketed rain non-stop for 1,000 years, they figured that it's got to be at least 10 to 15,000 years old, maybe a lot older. When this evidence gets out to the world, it will be one of the most powerful revelations on this planet in a very, very long time. It's going to have a bigger effect on the world's view of itself than probably any other discovery. This evidence has not entered the schools or general knowledge yet, though it has gone all around the planet. It has been looked at and checked out and thought about and argued over, and in the end most scientists have agreed that it cannot be doubted. So the age of the Sphinx has now been put back to at least 10,000 years, maybe 15,000 or a lot more, and it's already changing the entire world view of the people on the cutting edge of archaeology. You see, judging by everything we presently think we know, the oldest civilized people in the world were the Sumerians, and they go back to approximately 3800 BC. Before that, conventional knowledge says there was nothing but hairy barbarians no civilization at all anywhere on the whole planet. But now we have something man-made and civilized that's 10,000 to 15,000 years old. That changes everything. In the past, when something new like this is discovered that has a major influence on the viewpoint of the world, it takes about a hundred years for it to get to the people, for the average person to say, oh, yes, that is true, but this time it'll happen a lot quicker because of television, computers, the internet and the way things are today. Now scientific circles, for the first time ever, are actually beginning to look at the words of Plato in a new light when he talked about another culture, another continent, from a dim past called Atlantis. The Sphinx is the largest sculpture on the planet. It was not done by hairy barbarians, but by a very sophisticated culture. And it was not done by anybody we now know here on Earth. From a scientific point of view, this is the first solid evidence to be accepted about the true age of civilization. There has been lots of other evidence, but people just kept putting it under the table. 
This information on the Sphinx has made a crack in our world view. This took place about 1990, and the crack is now widening. We now have the accepted evidence that there absolutely had to have been someone on Earth who was highly civilized as early as 10,000 years ago. You can see how that's going to completely change our view of who we think we are. Edgar Case, The Sphinx and the Hall of Records I find it extremely interesting that the Sphinx is causing this change, especially in view of what the ARE, Association for Research and Enlightenment, has been saying. The ARE, a foundation based on teachings of, the sleeping prophet, Edgar Case, says that the Sphinx contains the opening to the Hall of Records. The Hall of Records is an alleged underground chamber containing physical proof of superior ancient civilizations on Earth. Case is a very interesting prophet. He made about 14,000 predictions in his lifetime, and by 1970, 12,000 of those predictions had come true and 2,000 were still in the future. And in all those predictions, he made only one tiny mistake. Out of 12,000 predictions, that's incredible. You can almost forgive him for that one mistake. He received a letter from a man in France asking for a health reading, but Case mistakenly gave a reading on the inquirer's twin brother. That was his only mistake. Every other thing came true exactly as Case had predicted up until 1972. However, after 1972 mistakes began to happen, and I'll explain why at the right time. For those who think Case's prediction that Atlantis would rise to the surface before 1970 did not come true, check out the January 1970 issue of Life magazine. Islands did come to the surface in the area where Case said Atlantis was located, some sank again and some are still above water today. According to Case, the right paw of the Sphinx is the opening to the Hall of Records. Both Thoth and Case have said that there are physical objects hidden in a room underground near the Sphinx that absolutely prove that there were advanced cultures on this planet long before us. Thoth says that these objects will prove the existence of these advanced cultures as far back as five and a half million years. In comparison, our level of culture is but a child to these ancient cultures. In fact, according to Thoth, civilization on this planet actually extends back 500 million years, and our very first culture originally came from the stars. But something colossal happened five and a half million years ago that affected the Akashic records. I cannot understand how that could even take place, because of what I understand the Akashic records to be. According to what I know, anything that occurs, occurs forever in vibrational form. So I don't understand how the Akashic records can be destroyed, yet I am told this is true. Introducing Thoth Who is Thoth? What you're seeing in this illustration, figure 1 to 10, is Egyptian hieroglyphics. Everything in the picture is hieroglyph, not just the images at the top. Hieroglyph means holy writings. These hieroglyphs are drawn on papyrus, which was supposedly the first paper in the world. The person depicted here is a man named Thoth, pronounced with a long O. Someday people say Thoth, but he pronounces it Thoth. The hieroglyph shows his head as an ibis, a bird. So whenever you see this man with wide shoulders and a strange looking bird head, it's a hieroglyph depicting this particular being, Thoth. He's holding papyrus reeds because he was the person who introduced writing to the world. The introduction of writing was a profoundly important event, probably the most influential act that has ever occurred on this planet in this cycle. It made more changes in our evolution and consciousness than any other single act in our known history. Thoth is also holding in his left hand something called the Ankh, which is the symbol for eternal life. The Ankh is an extremely significant symbol in this work, just as it was one of the primary symbols in Egyptian times. There is an electromagnetic energy field surrounding our bodies shaped like the Ankh. The remembrance of it, according to the Egyptian point of view, is the beginning of our returning home to eternal life and true freedom, so the Ankh is a primary key. 
all these things are an introduction. I'll be skipping all over the place, talking about many different subjects that won't seemingly be tied together, then slowly, as we proceed, I'll bring them all together in one coherent picture. On my second trip to Egypt, I went everywhere looking for this little bird called an ibis. They supposedly lived in the reeds, so I looked through the reeds with my camera. I kept looking for one the whole time I was there. I looked from one end of Egypt to the other but never saw a single ibis. I had to wait until I got back to the Albuquerque Zoo to take this picture, figure 1 to 11. They look kind of like short-legged stalks with bright pink feathers. Here is the writing, figure 1 to 12. This is a copy of a wall, and this next photo, comma, figure 1 to 13, is an actual wall sculpture. He's kneeling here, holding the pen and writing. This was a revolutionary act that had never been attempted before in this cycle. According to the conventional version of history, this act took place in Egypt during the time of Saqqara, but I have my doubts. I personally believe that it took place about 500 years earlier. Saqqara was built during the first dynasty, approximately 3300 BC. When we talk about the pyramids older than Saqqara, you will understand why I believe this. My story? Barclay Beginnings Some of you may not accept the possibility of communication with beings on other dimensional levels, but this is what took place in my life. I didn't ask for it, it just happened. As it turned out, I had almost daily communication on interdimensional levels for a number of years with this man Thoth. Now that I understand it more, my personal relationship with Thoth really began when I was in college at Berkeley. I majored in physics and minored in mathematics until I was just about to receive my diploma. I needed only one more quarter to graduate. I decided I didn't want the degree, because I had discovered something about physicists that turned me off to the idea of becoming involved in a science that I believed was no science at all. This is all changing now. This in itself could be a book, but the why of it is related to the same thing I said about archaeologists. Physicists, just like archaeologists, will turn their heads away from the truth if it means too much of a change too fast. Perhaps the real truth is that this is human nature. So I switched to the other side of my brain and started majoring in fine arts. My counselors thought I was nuts, you're going to give up a physics degree? They asked. But I didn't need it, didn't want it. Then to graduate I had to go for two more years majoring in fine arts and art history. Changing majors makes sense now, because when you study the ancient writings, you find out that the ancients perceived art, science and religion as interwoven, interconnected. So the programming I was putting myself through was appropriate for what I'm doing now. Dropping out to Canada. I got my degree in 1970. After going through Vietnam and looking at what was happening in our country at the time, I finally said, I've had it. This is it. I don't know how long I'm going to live or what's going to happen, but I'm just going to be happy and do what I've always wanted to do. I decided to get away from everything and go live in the mountains like I had always wanted. So I left the United States and went to Canada, not knowing there would be thousands of Vietnam War protesters following me a year later. I married a woman named Renice, and the two of us went into the middle of nowhere and found a little house on Guten Lake. We were a long way away from anything. You had to walk four miles from the nearest road to get to my house so we were really isolated. I began to live my life exactly like I had always wanted to live. I had always wanted to see if I could live on nothing, so I gave it a try. It was a little scary at first, but it got easier as time went on, and pretty soon I became adept at natural living. I lived a wonderful and full life on basically no money. After a while I realized, hey, this is a lot easier than holding a job in a city. I had to work hard for only about three hours a day, then I had the rest of the day off. It was great. I could play music and run around and have a good old time. And that's exactly what I did. I had fun. 
I played music about 10 hours a day, with lots of friends who came from miles around. Our place had gained quite a reputation by then. We just had fun. In doing this, which is very important to my understanding now, I discovered something about myself. It was from this, returning to my inner child, is how I phrase it these days that my inner child was released, and in that releasing, something happened to me that was the catalyst that led into my life as it is today. The two angels and where they led me. While in Vancouver, Canada, we decided that we wanted to know about meditation, so we started studying with a Hindu teacher who lived in the area. My wife and I were very serious about wanting to understand what meditation was about. We had made hooded white silk robes to show respect. Then one day, after practicing meditation for about four or five months, two tall angels about ten feet high appeared in our room. They were right there one was green and one was purple. We could see through their transparent bodies, but they were definitely there. We did not expect this to take place nor did we ask for it. We were just following the instructions that our Hindu teacher was giving us. I don't believe he fully understood either, as he kept asking us many questions. From that moment on my life was never the same. It wasn't even close. The first words the angels said were, we are you. I had no idea what they meant. I said, you're me. Then slowly they began to teach me various things about myself in the world and about the nature of consciousness. Finally my heart completely opened to them. I could feel tremendous love from them, which totally changed my life. Over a period of many years they led me to about 70 different teachers. They would actually tell me in meditation the address and the phone number of the teacher I was to go see. They would tell me either to call first or just show up at his or her house. So I would do this and it would always be the right person. Then I would be instructed to stay with that person for a certain length of time. Sometimes, right in the middle of a particular teaching, the angels would say, Okay, you're done. Leave. I remember when they sent me to Ramdas. I hung out in his house for about three days wondering what the heck I was doing there, then one day I went to touch him on the shoulder to say something, and I got a zap that practically knocked me to the floor. The angels said, that's it. You can leave now. And I said, okay. Ramdas and I became friends, but whatever I was supposed to leave from him was over within that one second. The teachings of Neem Karoli Baba, Ramdas's teacher are very important to me. It was his belief that, the best form to see God is in every form. I've also been exposed to Yogananda's work and cherish who he was. Later we'll be talking about Sri Yukteswar and some of his work. I've been intensely involved in almost all the major religions. I've resisted the Sikhs because I do not believe that military preparation is necessary but I've studied and practiced almost all the rest of them Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Taoist, Sufi, Hindu, Tibetan Buddhist. I've deeply studied Taoism and Sufism. I spent 11 years with Sufism. However, through all this study, the most powerful teachers for me have been the Native Americans. It was the Indians who opened the doorway for all my spiritual growth to take place. They've been a very powerful influence in my life. But that's another story, some of which I'll give in time. All the world's religions are speaking of the same reality. They have different words, different concepts and ideas, but there's really only one reality, and there's only one spirit moving through all life. There might be different techniques to get to different states of consciousness, but there's only what is real, and when you're there you know it. Whatever you want to call it you can give it different names it's all the same thing. Alchemy and the first appearance of Thoth At one point the angels led me to a Canadian man who was an alchemist and who, amongst other things, was actually turning mercury into gold, though it can also be done from a lead, which is more difficult. I studied alchemy for two years with him and watched this process with my own eyes. He had a sphere of glass about 18, 
in diameter filled with a liquid, and little bubbles of mercury would rise into it. They would go through a series of fluorescent colors and changes, rise to the top, turn into little balls of solid gold, then sink down to the bottom. Then he would collect all these little balls of gold to use for his spiritual work. He owned an ordinary looking little house in Burnaby, British Columbia, on an ordinary looking street. If you drove down the street, his house would look like any of the others. But under his house was a hidden laboratory. He had taken the millions of dollars in gold and dug straight down, building a huge complex filled with everything from electron balances to you name it so that he could further his work. He didn't care about money at all. And of course the purpose in alchemy is not to make gold or money, but to understand the process of how mercury or lead changes into gold. It's the process that's important. Because the process of going from mercury to gold is identical to the process that a human follows going from this level of consciousness into Christ consciousness, there is an exact correlation. As a matter of fact, if you were to study all of alchemy, you would have to study every single chemical reaction in existence, because every reaction has a corresponding experiential aspect to something in life. It's the old, as above, so below, saying. By the way, Thoth is the man who originally spoke those words when he was known as Hermes in Greece. At one point I was sitting in front of this alchemist teacher, and we were doing a particular kind of open-eyed meditation where we were locking breaths and breathing a certain way. He was sitting about three feet away from me, and we had been in this meditation for maybe an hour or two, a pretty fair length of time. Then something happened something I had never seen before, ever. He kind of went fuzzy, then disappeared right before my eyes. He was just gone. I'll never forget it. I sat there for a moment and didn't know what to do. Then I hesitantly reached over and felt for him. There was nobody there. I thought, wow. I was totally in astonishment. It blew my mind, as we were say in the 60s and 70s. It definitely did. I didn't know what to do, so I just continued to sit there. Then pretty soon a different person appeared in front of me, somebody completely and absolutely different. It wasn't even close. My alchemist teacher was about 35 years old and this guy was maybe 60 or 70, and a lot shorter maybe 5 feet 3 or 4. He was a little guy, and he looked Egyptian. He had dark skin and his hair was kind of long, but pulled back. He had a clean shaven face except for a thick beard growing from his chin that was perhaps six inches long and tied in five places. He was dressed in simple tan colored cotton clothing with long sleeves and pants and sat cross legged facing me. After my shock wore off, I just looked into this person's eyes. There I saw something I hadn't seen before except in baby's eyes. When you look into a little baby's eyes, you know how easy it is because there's nothing going on, no judgment, no nothing. You can just fall into their eyes, and they'll fall into yours. Well, that's what it was like to look at this man. There were just these big baby eyes in this old body. He didn't have anything going on. I had an instant connection with this person, and there were no barriers. He touched my heart like no one had ever done before. Then he asked me a question. He said there were three missing atoms in the universe, and did I know where they were? I had no idea what he meant, so I said, well, no. Then he gave me an experience, which I am not going to describe that sent me way back in time to the beginning of creation and brought me forward again. It was a very interesting out of body experience. When I came back, I understood what he meant about the three missing atoms at least I thought I did. And I said, well, I think what you mean is this, and proceeded to tell him what I thought. When I finished, he just smiled, bowed and disappeared. A little later my alchemist teacher reappeared. My teacher didn't know the change had taken place. Everything that happened seemed to be only in my experience. I went away from that totally preoccupied with the experience. At the time, the angels had me working with for other teachers, 
so I was going from one to the next to the next, and my life was really full. But I couldn't think about anything except this little man who had appeared to me. I never asked him who he was, and he didn't return. Time went on, and finally the experience started to fade away. But I always carried the question, who was that guy? Why did he have me go look for those three items, and what was this all about? I had a longing to see him again, because he was the purest person I had ever met ever. Twelve years later I found out who he was. It was Thoth. On November 1st 1984, he reappeared in my life. And taught me so much. But again, that's another story for later. Thoth the Atlanteon. This man, Thoth of Egypt, goes almost all the way back to the beginning of Atlantis. He figured out, 52,000 years ago, how to stay conscious in one body continuously without dying, and he has remained in his original body since then until 1991, when he moved into a new way of being far beyond our understanding. He lived through most of the period of Atlantis and even became king of Atlantis for a period of 16,000 years. During those times he was called Chikitet Alik Vmalites. His name was actually Alik Vmalites, and Chikitet was a title that meant, the seeker of wisdom, because he really wanted to be what wisdom was. After Atlantis sank, we will discuss this subject in great detail soon, Alik Vmalites and other advanced beings had to wait for about 6,000 years before they could begin to re-establish civilization. When Egypt began to come to life, he stepped forward and called himself Thoth, keeping that name all through the time of Egypt. When Egypt died, it was Thoth who started the next major culture, which was Greece. Our history books say that Pythagoras was the father of Greece and that it was from and through the Pythagorean school that Greece unfolded and from Greece that our present civilization emerged. Pythagoras says in his own writings that Thoth took him by the hand, led him under the Great Pyramid and taught him all the geometries and the nature of the reality. Once Greece was born through Pythagoras, Thoth then stepped into that culture in the same body he had during the time of Atlantis and called himself Hermes. So it is written, Alec of Malites, Thoth and Hermes are the same person. True story? Read the Emerald Tablets written 2000 years ago by Hermes. Since that time he's had many other names, but I still call him Thoth. He came back into my life in 1984 and worked with me just about every day until 1991. He'd come in and spend maybe 4 to 8 hours a day teaching me about so many things. This is where the largest body of the information I'll be sharing with you came from though it correlates with other information and has been substantiated by many other teachers. The history of the world, especially, came from him. You see, while in Egypt, where he was called the scribe, he wrote down everything that took place. He was the perfect person for it, right? He was constantly alive, so as a scribe he would just sit there and watch life go by. He was a good impartial witness as that was a major part of his understanding of wisdom. He seldom talked or acted except when he knew that it was in divine order. Eventually Thoth discovered how to leave earth. He would go to another planet where there was life and just sit there and watch. He would never interfere, wouldn't say a single word. He'd be absolutely silent and just watch just to see how they lived their lives, to get wisdom to understand for maybe a hundred years on each planet. Then he would go somewhere else and watch. Altogether, Thoth was gone from Earth for about two thousand years studying other life forms. But he considers himself an Earth person. Of course, we have all come from somewhere else at one point or another in the game of life, because the Earth is not that old. It's only about five billion years old and spirit is forever, always has been and always will be. You always have been and always will be. Spirit cannot die, and any other understanding is just an illusion. But Thoth considers himself from here because it was here that he made the first step that led him into immortality. This is Thoth's wife, Shesat, 
figure 1 to 14. She's a most extraordinary person in some ways at least as extraordinary as Thoth, if not more so. She was the first person to bring me consciously to earth, which was in, roughly, 1500 BC. I was not physically here, but we had made a conscious link across the dimensions. She connected with me because of problems the Egyptians were having within their country that, from her point of view, would eventually affect the whole world and the outcome of humanity. We worked very closely together. I still have a very deep love for her and a really close connection, though she's no longer here. Neither is Thoth. In 1991, together they left this entire active of universes and stepped over into a completely different kind of experience of life. Their actions are important to us, as you will see. In 1984, Thoth came back into my life, twelve years after my first experience with him while meditating with my alchemy teacher. The first thing he did was to lead me through an initiation in Egypt. He had me travel all over Egypt and perform ceremonies and accept initiations at certain temples. I was asked to enter a particular space under the Great Pyramid, repeat long phrases in the original Atlantean language and enter a state of consciousness where my body was only light. I'll tell that story when it's time, I promise. Thoth, Geometries and the Flower of Life After I had been back from Egypt for three or four months, Thoth came in and said, I want to see the geometries that were given to you by the angels. The angels had given me the basic information slash geometries of how reality is related to spirit, and the angels had taught me the meditation I am going to give to you. This meditation was one of the first things Thoth wanted from me. That was the exchange, I received all of his memories and he received the meditation. He wanted the meditation because it was a lot easier than the method he was using. His way of staying alive for 52,000 years was very tenuous it was like hanging on by a thread. It required him to, to spend two hours every day in meditation or he would die. He had to spend one hour with his head to the north and his feet to the south, in a very specific meditation, then he had to spend another hour in the reverse position doing a different meditation. Then once every 50 years, in order to keep his body regenerated, he had to go into what's called the Halls of Munti and sit for ten years or so before the Flower of Life. This is a pure flame of consciousness that resides deep in the womb of the earth and to which humanity's level of consciousness is completely dependent for its very existence. More later on this subject. Thoth was very interested in this new meditation because what took him two hours to accomplish takes only six breaths with the Merkaba meditation. It's quick, efficient and far more accurate, and its potential is much greater, as it leads into a permanent form of awareness. So Thoth began to give me vast amounts of what he knew. When he would appear in my room, we would not speak with words like we're doing now. We would speak using a combination of telepathy and holographic images. His thoughts to me were holographic, I guess you would say. But there was even more going on than that. If he wanted to describe something to me, I would taste, feel, smell, hear and see his thoughts. He said he wanted to see what the angels had given me in terms of geometries, so I gave it to him telepathically, with a little ball of light, third eye to third eye. Then he looked at the whole thing, and about five seconds later said that I was missing many levels of interconnected information. So for many hours of every day I would sit there making drawings and figuring out what all this stuff was that we now call sacred geometry. At that time I had no words for this way of seeing. I didn't know what it was, and in the beginning I had no idea what it really meant. And I didn't know anybody else who was aware of it except in the past. I thought I was the only one in the whole world. But the more I became involved, the more I realized that it's been going on forever and it's everywhere throughout the earth's history and throughout the universe. He taught me in this way for a long time. Finally we came up with a single drawing, figure 1 to 15, which he said contains everything all knowledge, both male and female, no exceptions. This is the one, 
I know this is an outrageous statement to make this early in this writing, but this one drawing, according to Thoth, contains within its proportions every single aspect of life there is. It contains every single mathematical formula, every law of physics, every harmony in music, every biological life form right down to your specific body. It contains every atom, every dimensional level, absolutely everything that's within waveform universes. I'll explain in just a moment about waveform universes. After he taught me, I understood the above statement, but to just throw out that statement right now sounds incredible. God willing, I will prove what I'm saying. Obviously, I cannot prove that this drawing contains every single aspect of creation, because there are too many things that exist to do that in one book. But I can show you enough of proofs so that you'll be able to see that you can carry it over to everything. Thoth then told me that I would find this image of the flower of life in Egypt. There were two times that I doubted him in all the years I worked with him, and this was one of those times. My little mind went, no way, because I had by now read almost every book there was on Egypt, and I had never seen this anywhere. In my mind I scanned through everything I could think of. No, I thought, that symbol is not anywhere in Egypt. But he said I would find it, and then he left. I didn't even know where to begin to look for it. About two weeks later, I saw my friend Katrina Raphael, who has written, I believe, three books on crystals. She had just returned from Egypt and was in a grocery store in Toes, New Mexico, when I walked in. She was standing at the film counter and had just gotten back the photographs from her most recent trip to Egypt. She had a stack about 10 inches high sitting on the counter and was taking them out, 36 at a time, and stacking them. We started talking, and at one point she said to me, Oh, by the way, my guiding angel told me that I'm supposed to give you a photograph as soon as I see you. I said, Okay, what is it? She said, I don't know. She turned away from the pile and went through it behind her back, pulled one out at random, handed it to me and said, this is the one I'm supposed to give you. Now, Katrina had no idea of the work I was doing, though we had been friends for a couple years, because I didn't talk to many people in those days about my work and I definitely had not talked to her. The picture she pulled out was this one the flower of life on a wall in Egypt, figure 1 to 16. That particular wall is probably one of the oldest walls in Egypt, in a temple that's almost 6,000 years old, one of the oldest temples on the planet. When I saw the flower of life in that photo, I couldn't say anything but, wow. Katrina asked, what is that thing, anyway? All I could say was, you don't understand, but wow.